Hello and welcome to St. Martin's Church Dorking for our 10 o'clock Eucharist service, our Holy Communion on this feast day of St. Luke, physician and evangelist. My name is Derek and I would like to welcome you here. Whether this is your first time joining us online or whether you are a regular worshipper with us, either way, we are so pleased that you've joined us. We're gathering together online in all sorts of different places to meet with God in our worship, to hear the scriptures read and then explained today by our preacher, the Reverend David Williams, to give praise to God in our hymns and to make our prayers to him. It's really good to welcome you here and our service will be beginning in just a few moments, so let's be quiet for a short while and simply remember that wherever we are right now, we are nevertheless in the presence of God. Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let's say together our prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second 
is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. The saints were faithful unto death and now dwell in the heavenly kingdom forever. As we celebrate their joy, let us bring to the Lord our sins and our weaknesses and ask for his mercy. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you called Luke, the physician, whose praise is in the gospel, to be an evangelist and physician of the soul. By the grace of the Spirit, and through the wholesome medicine of the gospel, Give your church the same love and power to heal through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from the book of Isaiah. It's chapter 35 and beginning to read at the third verse. Strengthen the feeble hands. Steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm number 147, verses 1 to 7. Hallelujah! How good it is to make music for our God! How joyful to honour him with praise! The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted, binds up all their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His wisdom is beyond all telling. The Lord lifts up the poor but casts down the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the lyre. Alleluia. Our second reading today is from the second letter of Timothy, chapter 4, and beginning to read at verse 5. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defence, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Alleluia, alleluia. I have called you friends, says the Lord, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. The Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So this morning, I'm very pleased that to preach our sermon, we have our friend, the Reverend David Williams. David. Today is one of the major festivals in the church's year because October the 18th is the feast of St. Luke, gospel writer, co-traveler with St. Paul and author of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And that is why both our altar frontal and vestments are red instead of the usual green for the Trinity season. Red is the color associated with the apostles and with the Holy Spirit and Christ's kingship and martyrs. All the gospel writers historically also have their own symbol. Matthew's is a figure with a human face. Mark's is a lion. Luke's is an ox or calf and St. John's is an eagle. And you will often find the gospel writers depicted with these symbols in stained glass windows and carved and painted decoration in our churches. These symbols are to be found in the book of Revelation, portrayed as the four living creatures standing around the heavenly throne who praise God without ceasing day and night. The reason that the ox or calf has been attributed to St. Luke is because of his particular emphasis on the sacrificial character of Christ's ministry and the ministry of those who followed him, especially Paul and Peter. Luke is often also known amongst the gospel writers as the physician and his gospel has a particular focus on the healing miracles of Jesus and after Pentecost on the healing miracles in the early church. I'm sometimes asked which is my favorite gospel, which is a difficult question to answer, but I'm inclined to say that it is Luke, who for me has a remarkable eye for telling detail, a particular sensitivity for people's places, situations and events, and an engaging and flowing narrative style. And the book of Acts, written by Luke, is also one of my favorite books in the Bible because of its compelling and graphic narrative. But what do we know about Luke? In his letter to the Colossians, Paul refers to Luke as the beloved physician. He was companion of St. Paul in some of his missionary journeys. 
Macedonia, Greece, and on Paul's last journey to Rome. And we can see the way in which the storyline in the book of Acts moves in several places from a straight narrative to a personal account. For example, after Luke relates that Paul had seen the vision of the man of Macedonia, he goes on to say, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. In our epistle reading from 2 Timothy, Paul, writing from prison in Rome, says that only Luke is with me. And as Paul contemplates his own ministry, drawing to a close with his impending trial and death, he encourages Timothy to come to Rome to receive the commission of discipleship from him personally, so that Timothy will return to Asia Minor to continue and further Paul's missionary work. Luke's presence with Paul in Rome is significant, and Luke is often thought to have been the one who wrote the letter to Timothy on Paul's behalf. It's also interesting to note that in his short letter to Philemon, Luke is described by Paul as one of his fellow workers. The central theme of today's epistle reading is the cost of discipleship in the face of adversity, but also its reward and its fulfillment. And this is a theme that we find reflected throughout Luke's writing. There is a long established tradition testified by the early fourth century church historian Eusebius that Luke was one of the first members of the Christian community at Antioch. But what we find in later traditions, such as the assertion that Luke was an icon painter as well as a writer, I'm afraid, is pure speculation. But much can be gleaned about Luke's character from his writings. Luke is indeed the author of the largest block of writing in the New Testament because Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts together exceed in length all of Paul's epistles. The elements which are distinctive to Luke's Gospel include the account of the virgin birth of Christ, some of the most moving parables such as those of the Good Samaritan and the Prodigal Son, and the words of Christ in his passion to the women of Jerusalem and to the penitent thief. All these elements underline the compassion of Christ, which together with Luke's emphasis on humility, prayer and purity of heart, perhaps help to explain his special appeal to the Gentiles, to whom his gospel and the book of Acts is particularly addressed. Also, women figure more prominently in Luke's gospel than in any other. For example, Mary, Elizabeth, the widow of Nain, and the woman who was a sinner. In the Acts of the Apostles, Luke shows himself to be a perceptive and meticulous observer, concerned with making links between religion and the wider world. He casts a historian's eye on his material, which particularly appeals to me as a historian. And this is evident not only in the broad structure of his narrative about Jesus and the emerging church, but in the many references to the larger historical context in which the story unfolds. For example, from Luke 2, 1 to 2, in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So you see how much detail is packed into those two verses. Numerous references to time, place, and principal characters help to give Luke's Gospel and the Book of Acts an historical and geographical rootedness, colour, and reality. When we look at the theological themes in Luke, we find that he focuses on the relationship of church and synagogue, of Jesus and church, and of the church and the wider world. He also highlights the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus and the life of the church, the economic and political implications of the gospel, the meaning of discipleship, and the expectations of the end time and the second coming. 
Luke also shows himself to be an artist with words. When, for example, Luke and Mark tell the same stories, Luke smooths awkward lines, broadens the range of verbs, distills the content, and rounds off stories left a bit unfinished by Mark, stories that need conclusion. Luke uses particular patterns in his narrative, accounts of journeys by Jesus and the apostles, <clears throat> notably Paul, accounts of trials and courtroom scenes, farewell speeches and stories of miraculous revelation. Luke shows great skill in the use of contrast, and he also uses restraint to create anticipation, and he knows the power of the recurring theme. Above all, for Luke, the Hebrew scriptures are foundational, and there are many Old Testament references and allusions in his writing. Indeed, Luke will often tell a story about Jesus or one of the early church leaders after the manner of, or in the very words, of an Old Testament story. This brings me to my final reflection and the subject of our Gospel reading today. Luke is sometimes referred to as the Gentile Gospel, in the same way that Matthew is sometimes described as the Jewish Gospel. The major theme of Luke's writing is the outreach of the Gospel and its availability to all nations. The account of the commissioning of the 70 disciples in today's Gospel is found only in Luke though Matthew and Mark both recall the sending out of the 12. But why 70? 70 is significant in the Old Testament because it alludes to Moses' choice of 70 elders to be his helpers. But more particularly, it recalls the 70 nations listed in the account of the nations descended from Noah, which we find in Genesis chapter 10, which represented the known world at the time. So Luke draws on the Old Testament, proclaims Christ's commission to his followers, and anticipates the gospel mission to all nations begun at Pentecost, when people gathered from every nation under heaven. And he is anticipating the spread of the gospel across Asia Minor, Greece, Macedonia towards Italy, and Spain and beyond, which is described so vividly in the book of Acts and which continues today. And what message does Jesus ask the 70 to convey to all the places to which they will go? It is the message of salvation, healing, and peace. The first words that the 70 are invited to say to the households they visit are simply peace. To this house. These are the words on a terracotta plaque you will find by one door of my house, in Latin, Pax Huic Domini, and they are a constant reminder to me of the blessing that Christ offers and the message of salvation which we are offered to offer to others in his name. Amen. David, thank you. So now let us declare our faith in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the words of the Nicene Creed. Together we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So now please join me in a short time of prayer. Julia. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. He does not deal with us according to our sins, but has given us new life in the resurrection of his Son. In peace and confidence, let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all according to their needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh Lord, we pray for the work of your Holy Church in this country and throughout the world. We pray for Justin, our Archbishop, and for our bishops, Andrew and Joe. We pray for this church, for Derek, our vicar, and for all who live and work in this parish. Today we ask for your blessing on all doctors, thinking particularly of those working at Dorking Community Hospital, at Clarendon House, and at the New House, Hillside, Riverbank and Medwin surgeries. We give thanks for their knowledge and dedication. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our Queen, and for all those in positions of authority, that their hearts and actions may be directed towards righteousness and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. On this feast day of St Luke the Evangelist, we pray for all who seek the truth and do not find it, for those who have lost faith, for those who live with broken promises, for those ensnared in fantasy and error. We beseech you to look favourably on our efforts, made in accordance with our states in life and in the power of the Holy Spirit, to proclaim Christ, your word made flesh, who stands at the beginning and the end and in whom all things hold together. And as we do our best to bear witness to the gospel in our daily lives, we pray that our words may help others to know your truth, our actions may help others to know your love, and our relationships may help others to know your friendship and encouragement. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those known to us and for those who have asked for our prayers. God of love, whose compassion never fails, we commend to your mercy all who are distressed in body, mind or spirit. We pray especially for Dee, Cliff, Alan, Paul, Pamela, Alan, Rose and Renate. We pray for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have died, for those who have no one to pray for them, and for all whom we have known and loved, who have gone before us into the light and glory of heaven. For Jackie Hinton, for George Hunter. We pray for those whose year's mind occurs at this time. For Brian Powell. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Be with us, Lord, in all our prayers, and direct our way toward the attainment of salvation that among the changes and chances of this mortal life, we may be always defended by your gracious help. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Julia. Now at that point in our service where we share the peace with one another. May the God of peace sanctify you. May he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before him at the coming of our Lord Jesus with his saints. The peace of the Lord be always with you. 
Let us offer one another a sign of peace. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. We rejoice in the glorious splendor of your majesty, for you have given us a share with Luke in the inheritance of the saints in light. In the darkness of this passing age, they proclaim the glory of your kingdom. Chosen as lights in the world, they surround our steps as we journey on towards the city of eternal light, where they sing the everlasting song of triumph. In communion with angels and archangels, and all who have served you on earth and worship you now in heaven. We raise our voices to proclaim your glory for ever praising you and singing.
you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so together we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty God, who on the day of Pentecost sent your Holy Spirit to the apostles with the wind from heaven and in tongues of flame, filling them with joy and boldness to preach the gospel, by the power of the same Spirit, strengthen us to witness to your truth and to draw everyone to the fire of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we pray. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice, 
send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. for this feast day of St. Luke is drawing to a close and it just remains for me to say a big thank you to the musicians of St. Martin in the Fields, Trafalgar Square for providing the choral music that accompanies our worship. Thank you very much indeed. And also a big thank you to you for inviting me as the representative of this faith community um, to join you wherever you might be today and whenever this might be, morning, afternoon or evening. It's a great privilege to be able to join you like this and my hope is very sincerely that one day you might find your way into this wonderful church of St. Martin's Dorking and we might meet face to face. Until that time comes, I leave you with a blessing. God give you grace to follow his saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>